Hello everyone from Ukraine, you're watching Channel 24, my name is Andriy Drozda and our guest today is uh, Mr. Shota Gwineri, a defense and security expert from Georgia. Uh, he's now a lecturer at Baltic Defense College uh, till uh, 2017. Mr. Gwineri was uh, Georgia's ambassador at large for NATO and security policy. And prior to that, Mr. Gwineria served as an ambassador of Georgia in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Gwineri. Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the chance to talk about this uh, very important issue. Uh, I hope my introduction was correct. I didn't make any mistakes there. Oh, all good. Fine. Good. Uh, so, uh, let us start from this basic question actually could you please tell us your point of view when exactly russia has chosen this um, way to imperial aggression and dominance uh, i mean in the in modern times in our times not in the ancient or historical times right now can we consider actually 2008 uh, uh, when russia attacked uh, georgia directly as a starting point to this countdown uh, which led us to this disaster that we observe right now? Well, first of all, let me send my warmest greetings and my admiration to the Ukrainian people. Slava Ukraina, I'm sure and most confident that uh, uh, your victory in this uh, uh, unjust and unprovoked war is just inevitable. Um, let's indeed look at the picture from a uh, little bit uh, wider perspective let zoom out and see what is russia doing and why is it doing it uh, so the one way of looking at uh, uh, russia's uh, foreign and security uh, strategy is to start from 2008 because that was really uh, indeed uh, a decisive moment when russia started to use its military instrument of power for achieving its geopolitical objective. But of course, it didn't start in 2008. Uh, and it started way beyond that. Uh, the moment when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, that very moment, uh, the so-called strategic thinkers in Kremlin, such as, for example, uh, Yevgeny Primakov, you know, they started to think about the role of the independent Russia uh, in this new type of world where they would find themselves after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, in the unilateral world after this, bi uh, let's say, bipolar world uh, uh, collapsed after uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, has lost the Cold War. So that's the moment when actually the modern Russian foreign and policy started, it was oriented on two things. One uh, was the full domination in the post-Soviet space, and the second was uh, to uh, uh, fight against the unipolar world with the U.S.-led West in, uh, let's say, charge of the rules-based international system. This is, this is nothing new. They, they were doing that uh, with the poor means they had at hand at that time. So in 2008, what happened was that they felt strong enough now to use its military force against the sovereign nation in Europe to change its borders. And they started to fight this war already uh, uh, with the conventional means of war warfare. But before that, they had this um, so-called frozen conflicts in Georgia and Moldova. Uh, they controlled the conflict in nagorno karabakh And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, actually the foreign policy tools for the Russian Federation not to allow its uh, neighboring states to develop, to flourish, and join the, the, the free, uh, free uh, world. Uh, but, but, but then, you know, in 2008, it started with the uh, invasion of Georgia. Then we saw what happened in Ukraine in 2014 because there was no sufficient response to what happened in Georgia. They actually were encouraged to 
uh, come to Crimea with their, let's say, sort of hybrid operation, and they instigated uh, 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 the conflict, armed conflict in eastern Ukraine. And then we are here where we are. So it's, uh, it's basically based on the mistakes that we have all made in, uh, uh, in deterring Russia uh, in previous years. Since uh, it all started to happen much earlier than Putin came to power, as you have said, uh, in the 90s, um, why did then uh, the Western country, uh, countries, and especially the United States, all the geopolitical powers, prefer to ignore this situation, just to not see, not to look at it uh, directly? Now, they even try to uh, make uh, their... Um, uh, their uh, actually contacts with Russia and policy towards Russia softer and better and kinder. Even they they even used this term Perezagruska in times of Barack Obama, uh, and they had this kind of illusion that uh, somehow the things could go the other way, not in a way of confrontation in a conflict. Um, uh, what was the reasons for such kind of policies? Well, the, the, the reason uh, of the West, uh, the reason and the core of the Western policy vis a vis Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union was basically uh, unfortunately based on the wishful thinking that Russia would be willing to engage and be integrated in the rules based international system. So this understanding that uh, the threat uh, uh, was gone by the dissolution of the Soviet Union and it was possible to have Russia as the partner and as a responsible player in Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, area, that was the, the strategic mistake uh, uh, that was made uh, by the uh, Western strategic thought, let's say. Uh, because uh, all the actions that have been taken uh, by the Russian Federation uh, right after the dissolution of the Soviet Union were indicating that actually they have never stopped fighting the Cold War. What happened in the 90s was that just one side, the West, thought that the Cold War was over, they stopped fighting the Cold War, but for Russians it's a pause. It was not the end of the Cold War. They never actually uh, uh, acknowledged the loss of the Cold War, uh, but no, they just realized... That Sorry they for interrupting. They have uh, acknowledged that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union as a tragedy as a tactical defeat in Cold War, but they continued to fight and just to grab all the possible resources for continuation of this war, yes? Exactly. So the, 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 there was a situation when there was the Cold War going on, but without one of the sides, the West in this case, realizing this or, or fighting this war. So there was the war where only one Part, one side, Russia, was actually conducting the warfare. And of course, this resulted into the situation when Russians were able to gain influences and to gain some tactical wins along the way. Uh, again, coming back to the uh, conflicts that they have been masterminding, protracting and maintaining in the in the uh, so-called near abroad around Russia. These were used uh, for uh, used as the tools to in enhance their influences in uh, the countries of the region. And the West was engaged in a different ball game. They were not engaged in this uh, warfare that Russia was doing, but they were trying to deter something that was already happening. And we were saying that, okay, guys, it's not up to you to decide to prevent a, a war or to provoke Russia. They have their own strategy, very consistent strategy. They're following the strategy. And what provokes Russia is not uh, basically a show of strong will to better Russia, but the weakness. And when, they, when you show that there is an opportunity for them to grab pieces of Georgia, Ukraine, or any other neighboring country without having to pay 
a adequate price for that, they will go for it. And that's what provokes their aggressive actions and not if they will think that actually the response will be very strong and the cost will be very high. And that's exactly what we see now uh, in, in Ukraine starting from February 24, 2002. I think. Well, Russian officials uh, still are using this manipulative language. You are provoking us. They they insisting the Ukraine is provoking us. Western countries are provoking us. And the fresh uh, the, the, the the fresh statement from Moscow is that. Uh, if Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, it will definitely lead us to the Third World War. Uh, it's nothing new in this uh, statement, of course. Now, what are the pr prospects um, of a membership of Ukraine and Georgia in NATO, from your point of view, your forecast? Well, uh, uh, actually... The membership of Georgia and Ukraine in NATO, I think, is an inevitable process because uh, uh, in Bucharest in 2008, uh, the political decision about this was already made by the Allies. Now, there was uh, uh, much more room for uh, specific progress and delivering some specific uh, progress on the way towards this decision before, which unfortunately did not happen as fast as, uh, as uh, we wanted this to see. Uh, but it's not a question of uh, if, it's a question of when and how it is going to happen. I don't see that um, NATO's enlargement uh, in Ukraine and Georgia will be a short-term uh, process or decision. It is a process which will take time and it will take uh, you know, some uh, specific, let's say, uh, steps to be taken on this way. But, uh, o o of course, uh, that, that is something that will uh, happen for sure, because this is the only way to secure those countries from further uh, aggression from the Russian Federation. We saw that there are only two deterrents for Russia. That's NATO membership and nuclear weapons. They do not care about any other agreement or any other sort of, you know, deterrent measures. But they will go and grab the opportunity if the price they will have to pay for their actions is not significantly higher than the cost that they will have to imply for, for their actions. Definitely. Uh, let us talk a little bit about the links between Georgia and Ukraine. We have this uh, spiritual, definitely, connection between our nations. So we are very, there is a friendship between Georgians and Ukrainians, very close uh, relationship. How does it show itself, the support of uh, Ukrainians in Georgian society? I mean, on the level, especially on the level of society, of population, and on the level of political elites, how does the position of uh, government, well, especially Prime Minister Garibashvili, and uh, differs from the uh, position of uh, President uh, Zurabishvili in Georgia? Is there any difference between their points of view? Well, uh, uh, with regard to the uh, position of the Georgian authorities or the official uh, uh, position of Georgia regarding the conflict in Ukraine. I think it's not only shameful, but it's also very harmful for Georgia's uh, national interests. So I think that in this uh, uh, monumental historic moment, Georgia does not have any moral or practical right to be on the other side of this conflict. And this is what we see at this point, unfortunately. We see that the support for Ukraine is nowhere close to where it is supposed to be because uh, everybody in Georgia on the population level, on the societal level, uh, understand that Ukraine is fighting the war not only for its own freedom and future, but for the future of all the nations uh, that have been fighting this war since the uh, uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. So, uh, for uh, so Georgia's destiny and fate uh, uh, is not decided in Tbilisi at this particular point in time, but it's decided in Ukraine. 
and the people understand that. People are very supportive of rain uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, thousands of um, uh, soldiers fighting there on behalf of Georgia and Georgian people are the best representatives of Georgia at this point. And the, the, the best representatives, unfortunately, are not in offices now. I hope this uh, uh, this is something that is visible also to Ukrainian people and because uh, the Georgian authority have a very wrong stance and posture in this uh, war today does not affect relationships between the two countries in the long run. Yeah, we understand that and we are very thankful to Georgia Nation, to the people who, who are supporting us. Now on the streets of Tbilisi, other towns, other cities, we, we can see well that and we are very thankful to Georgian volunteers who are fighting alongside the Ukrainians uh, on the battlefield. That's very important. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about this um, wave of uh, fleeing Russians, running Russians that are trying to hide in Georgia from the draft uh, campaign, from mobilization campaign, which was uh, announced by Putin um, some three weeks ago or so. And so hundreds of thousands Russians, of, of Russians, males or men, they, they are running uh, to neighboring countries right now. And many of them are trying to find uh, this safe haven in Georgia, especially. How they are accepted uh, in Georgia, are those people welcomed there and uh, what can, can we say right now, what would be the effect on Georgian society of this phenomena? Yeah, uh, first of all it's important to understand that Georgia and society uh, uh, are still under this uh, PTSD from the war in 2008, the wounds in Georgian society after uh, the invasion, brutal invasion of Russia is still there. So there is no way that the Georgian society would be welcoming all those, you know, uh, floods of Russians coming into Georgia with open arms. The, so the society... Uh, most of the society and the active part of the civil society is very concerned. They see a lot of risks and threats in this process. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, it, when a country that is occupying 20% of your territory is sending tens of thousands uh, of uh, its uh, uh, citizens uh, to your country, and you still remember that the pretext of invading your country a few years ago was to protect the interests of uh, the uh, Russian uh, minorities and nationals in Georgia, then, then of course, you... On, even on the superficial level, it is uh, clear that that is a threat for Georgia's national interest, and this process has to be controlled in a much more better way. But unfortunately, what we see that there is a zero trust from most of the Georgian uh, population in the uh, in the uh, processes that are uh, put forward by the authorities and we are very concerned that there are high risks related to the infiltration of some, let's say, special services and incorporation of a people who will be used for some sort of effective actions in the future if there will be a need for that or even, you know, having just uh, passively having that high numbers of Russian minority in Georgia is a threat in itself, having uh, in mind the record of the Russian Federation, how they used those minorities before in other countries. Got it. Um, let us also talk about the security and uh, defense in two regions, in Black Sea region and in Caucasian region, actually. We now have this military conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan there. Uh, 
um, in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, and it is a neighboring country to Georgia especially. What can Georgia actually contribute uh, in the defense model in, in uh, pr providing uh, security and strengthen the security and safety in Black Sea region? and also in Caucasian region right now regarding this Russian interference in these regions. Uh, um, how should we just support each other there? What can Ukraine actually, how could Ukraine, how can Ukraine help in future probably? And what, what can actually Georgia contribute into defense um, there? Yeah, well, uh, so first of all, uh, I must say that uh, first objective there uh, for everybody is that uh, Ukraine wins this war uh, as soon as possible with as little uh, losses on top of what we already have uh, as possible. And uh, that should be the objective for uh, not only the countries of the region, but, but uh, everybody who is uh, concerned about peace and stability in the Europe and the and the voting in the United Nations about supporting the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine uh, was a very good indicative of that. There were only four countries that Russians were able to persuade not to vote or not to support uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity. It's North Korea, it's Syria, Venezuela, and others. Yeah. So that already talks for itself, right? So it's... Uh, uh, I always try to make this point that I think that Russia has already lost this war, just Ukraine ha hasn't won yet. And there is a, a, some more to be done in order to actually materialize this uh, uh, defeat of the Russian Federation of the Republic into this strategic victory so that we can all, uh, we can all uh, talk about the, the, the final solution and the end state of, uh, of, of this uh, conflict. In this uh, situation, the role of Georgia, unfortunately, is not that well pronounced at this point, because as I said, it is not clear for me as yes, for the citizen of Georgia of where my, my own government stands at this point. I want to see much more support to Ukraine, much more direct support, political uh, economic, uh, military, whatever ways we can. We, we have a very good pattern here of how the Baltic states are pinching above their weight in supporting Ukraine. You know, they're leading all these charts in how they managed to consolidate all their resources to support Ukraine in a meaningful way. And Georgia is by design part of that group that is interested in Ukrainian victory by design. Uh, and I, I, I hope there will be a possibility for the uh, civil society of Georgia to somehow somehow reflect their solidarity and support uh, into the specific uh, actions, and there will be much more possibilities for doing so. But at this point in time, when authorities are so hesitant to openly support Ukraine and be on the right side in this conflict and pronounce their support in a, in a meaningful way, I think that uh, there, is, uh, there is limited possibilities for us to play a constructive role. At least if Georgia will not help Russia with, you know, for example, that uh, giving the alternative uh, opportunities for their citizens who are fleeing now this mobilization back in Georgia and uh, uh, registering their companies overnight in Georgia, avoiding this, uh, which can create these patterns for avoiding sanctions in, uh, at some point. Or if Georgian territory will not be used to supply Russia for its, uh, and Russia's war machine with the uh, with the uh, items that are banned uh, uh, under the sanctions, there is already a, 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 a substantial support. So I hope that Georgian authorities will at least play a fair game in this part. Got it. Well, probably the last question, Mr. Gwineria. From your point of view, what do you think? On which stage of this war uh, we 
are now actually how far we are from the ending are we on the middle uh, stage uh, in the middle of this war or we are getting closer for, uh, to an end to an ending how long it will just go on and how far are we from from the victory of ukraine which you say is inevitable yeah so uh, let me explain a little bit in more details why I think that it's, it is inevitable. You know, what we have been looking at for the uh, last few years was this uh, you know, blackmailing pattern of the Russian Federation. When they would create a problem, then they would invite everybody to the table to discuss to, to negotiate uh, so uh, how to solve the problem which they had created they yeah. have created yeah. you know with their own hands then escalate to the maximum point so the temperature is boiling hot everybody is scared to death they're afraid of this third world war or the nuclear exchange or whatever and then they would extract concessions from that negotiating table they would get a lot, if not all, that they were uh, looking for. They would digest this, uh, they would consolidate those gains, and they would repeat it in different geography, in different points in time. That was the pattern that they were using before successfully, at least uh, starting from the 2008 invasion of Georgia. What we see now is that on February 24, this pattern collapsed, so they have lost this ability to blackmail anybody. Uh, and uh, uh, they had to start acting on the ground in Ukraine. And we see what is the capacity of the Russian Federation to act on the ground. We see the almighty Russian armed forces. We see how uh, the political or uh, uh, economic or informational uh, elements can support the armed uh, forces there, which is a disaster. And the moment that this blackmail didn't work, they, uh, everybody saw that there is no capacity to act. So that's already a strategic defeat. So now the biggest uh, challenge uh, or a threat, if I may say so, is that we do not have to allow Russia to go back to this blackmail chain. Okay? Even with this nuclear blackmail or whatever, I think that what they're trying to do now after the catastrophic results that they, they delivered on the battlefield is that to come back to that blackmailing chain by saying, okay, do you want this nuclear exchange or what? So now how do we negotiate this process? So I think that here in the West, the debate should be clearly concentrated on what is the acceptable end state of this conflict for the Western state. Uh, and I think that it's very clear. I mean, uh, until every Russian soldier leaves the territory of Ukraine, there is no possibility of talking about you know, any sort of uh, solution to this conflict. Because even even if there is any deal between Ukraine and Russia, and even if this hot phase of conflict uh, stops at this point in time, if we do not solve this Russia problem in a bigger sense, you know, and if we again go into the trap of freezing this conflict and leaving it for the future, we see that actually this does not help and this does not solve the problem. It makes things only worse. And there is this escalatory potential which Russia can always use for blackmailing. So now is the moment when the West finally realized that they have to help Ukraine with whatever it takes or how long it takes to, to solve this. So now, I, on the battlefield, I don't think that uh, there is an easy fix or quick solution to this. I just think that Ukrainians are on the right track, they're doing the right thing. The West is on the right track, they're doing the right thing by supporting Ukraine. The, the, the trend is going in the right direction. And more Russians press forward with their illegal war crimes in Ukraine, more support is coming from this. And this is basically the precondition for me of the final success. And this is something that uh, will inevitably lead to the, to the success. Because you know, what we have heard uh, after 
the uh, nuclear acceleration of the nuclear blackmail or uh, absolutely criminal uh, and terrorist bombing of Kiev and other Ukrainian cities uh, uh, in recent days was war support was the Rammstein meeting deciding that actually Ukraine will get an integrated air defense systems, which is very important for your self-defense. Uh, the response was the United Nations uh, General Assembly deciding all the modes to anonymous to, if we don't count those you know, clown uh, dictator puppets of Putin that territorial integrity of Ukraine is not subject of negotiations and there is a, a, a consensus in the United Nations on that. So this very strong, decisive uh, support and unit, not only in the West, but also out here on almost on the global uh, scale, uh, <coughs> will, will inevitably come, uh, come to its uh, logical ending, which will be the, uh, Ukraine uh, in its uh, territorial um, integrity joining uh, European and Euro Atlantic institutions. But uh, I, I uh, actually. Uh, cannot, unfortunately, give you an exact timeline of uh, when this might uh, happen. And it will depend, again, on the, on the uh, level of inadequacy of Russian actions, and more they will push, the sooner they end to this uh, tragic war. You're absolutely right. Uh, there is no way to leave this uh, situation as a frozen conflict. You just can't leave the cancer tumor in the body and pretend that nothing wrong will happen, everything will go just fine. You have to surge it, you have to cure it, uh, and we have, uh, if we continue this analogy, we have to defeat Russia, probably dismantle it from this uh, imperial form of existence and uh, just uh, make make a, create a different future for Europe and for the world, of course. Thank you so much for this conversation, Mr. Guineri. It was a pleasure for me. It was a honor for me. It was a very interesting experience. And we hope to see you soon on our channel any day, uh, any day soon, actually. Thank you so much for this dialogue. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Stay strong. You will win. Hello, I'm Slava, and thank you, our dear audience. Uh, our guest today was Mr. Shota Guineri, a defense uh, expert from uh, Georgia, uh, who now uh, works in the Baltic states, actually, and is a lecturer of the Baltic Defense College. Uh, thank you for your attention, for watching. See you soon on our channel with our new guest.